Okay, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up tonight. Welcome to Avalon Bookstore. Uh, we couldn't convince Groucho Marx that he wasn't dead, so instead we have Dr. Robert Anton Wilson. <laughs> Shortest and most inter interesting introductions I ever had. Uh, am I am I the only one that noticed that that one of the last things Ronald Reagan did before leaving the presidency was to have an operation on his asshole? <laughs> and, uh, one of the first things uh, George Bush did uh, on entering the presidency was to have an operation on his middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, for a man my age, and uh, there are very few, most men my age are dead already, as Casey Stengel once said. Uh, for a man my age, it's uh, profoundly embarrassing that the president and vice president are named Bush and Quail. Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, uh, Quail in Brooklyn, uh, when I was reaching puberty, Quail had only one meaning it meant vagina. And uh, I didn't find out it also meant a bird until I was about 19. Uh, adolescence in Brooklyn in the 1940s, before the sexual revolution, before the 60s, before the Kinsey reports were published and everybody found out, gee, I'm not the only one who does that. Back in the dark ages, boys around the cusp of puberty would gather in the boys' room at the school and discuss bush and quail. Have you ever actually seen the bush? Yeah, my girl let me see a bush, but only quick for a minute, like, you know, I got two fingers of my girl's quail. And I grew up with that. I was, bush and quail, bush and quail. <laughs> <laughs> that's the age of adolescence. You're terrified that the grown-ups will find out you're thinking about sex, much less talking about it, and doing anything about it was absolutely out of the question. So this is all, I, I can say penis and vagina, and I'm okay. I can say prick and cunt, and I'm okay. But uh, the minute I get to quail, I'm, I'm 13 years old, and I'm terrified that uh, my parents are going to find out what I'm talking about with the other boys. And now every day I pick up the newspapers, and there it is, bush and quail, bush and quail. What are they doing to me? The Republican Party is out to destroy what's left of my sanity. And uh, you've all heard of the Church of the Subgenius, I trust. And you know, the secret, you know the secret phrase, Bob. You, you know the secret of power. What's the secret of power? Slack? No, no, no. Slack. Given how stupid the average guy is, statistically half the people are stupid. Right. You all know how dumb the average guy is. Well, mathematically, by definition, half of them are even dumber than that. <laughs> now, now, once you understand that, you can start your own religion and get as rich as Bob, or L. Ron Hubbard, or Roger Nish. You can have 93 Rolls Royces, though, if you just keep that in mind. Half of them are even dumber than average. And as if that's not bad enough uh, for the philosopher to contemplate, I mean, if you want to make money, it's good news, but if you're a philosopher, it's bad news. On top of that, we've got an incredibly large number of people nowadays who are just plain full of shit. I mean, have you noticed that? Movie stars, they're all full of shit these days. You can get them to endorse anything. Uh, I, I heard recently, honest to God, of the Carol Hemingway show. Maybe some of you up here have heard of Carol Hemingway. It was a very good talk show. She had a woman on who gets testimonials from movie stars for various products. She's in between. She makes a good profit on it. She said, Elizabeth Taylor recently turned down a million dollars to endorse something because she thought it was a rotten product. And suddenly I fell in love with Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> All these years, I just thought she's uh, <laughs> another Hollywood bubblehead, you know, uh, some acting talent, quite a bit of acting talent in some of her roles. 
but now I'm in love with her. This woman turned down a million dollars just on a matter of principle. And you can hardly find that these days. Uh, movie stars will endorse anything, and baseball players are even worse. You know, baseball players will get up there on television with their bare face hanging out and say, I never thought I'd like eating lepers, turds. <laughs> they gave me that competitive edge I need. I think they'll, they'll do anything for money. <laughs> Uh, AIDS is good for you. I haven't been so I've never been so happy as when I got AIDS. Come and get your injection. Right? They'll say it, you pay them enough money. So we get all these stupid people, and then we get all these celebrities who are full of shit. And then if you look around, you'll find out that at least 30 percent of the population are batshit crazy. Right? Well, on Santa Cruz, it's about 60 <laughs> percent. So, so, you, you got the just plain stupid, you got the ones who are full of shit, and you got the ones who are batshit crazy. And now we end up with a vice president who's all three at once. And he has to be named Quail, too. He goes down to Latin, he goes down to Latin America, he's in Brazil, he apologizes to the crowd because he can't speak Latin. <laughs> he was speaking to the Negro United Negro College Fund, and he tried to quote their slogan, and he said, it's a terrible thing to lose your mind. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible waste to lose your mind. I mean, <laughs> well, anyhow, I'm not going to do Dan Quayle jokes, though. he's too easy. <laughs> Besides, yes, uh, he had a great record in, uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, as soon as the Viet Cong found out that dangerous Dan had joined the Indiana National Guard. They gave up all plans to invade Terre Haute. Most people don't realize that. What I want to know is, have all these years of Playboy Center Fools been conditioning us to accept this Bush and Quail in the White House? Bush and Quail, Bush and Quail. You know the difference between Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler? This is of no interest to the women in the audience, but uh, I'll get to the women later. Uh, the difference between Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler, I spent a lot of time meditating on this. <laughs> Philosophers have to think about everything, you know, even the most trivial matters. In Playboy, the women look like they want you to make love to them, right? In Penthouse, they look like they get tired waiting and they start making love to themselves. And in Hustler, they look like they're having a gynecological examination. <laughs> now you know the difference. And now you know the three types of males who buy the three different magazines. The way we have three of them. There's a lot of inferior invitations, but those are the three major ones. These are the three basic approaches to Bush and Quail. And that's why we got Bush and Quail running the country. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Uh, I'm supposed to speak tonight about the Western Hermetic tradition. I've spoken and written so much about the Western Hermetic tradition that it bores me. Uh, however, I'll say something about the Western Hermetic tradition. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the earth is hollow, of course. Everybody here knows that. You you wouldn't be in a, an occult bookstore in Santa Cruz if you didn't know the earth is hollow. February 1990, we all know that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, one of the people who knew it was Jules Verne. Uh, that's why he wrote Journey to the Center of the Earth. As a matter of fact, it's in several of Jules Verne's novels. And if you get a hold of Michael Lamy's book, Jules Verne, Initiate and Initiator, you'll find out Jules Verne was a member of the Priory of Science. You see, we're getting into the Western occult tradition after all. Now, who are the Priory of Science? Well, according to this book, Jules Verne, Initiate and Initiator, the Priory of Science were formed in the 1890s as a front for the Illuminati of Bavaria, who had decided to go underground and conceal their existence and set up a front organization to recruit people. So the Priory of Zion are the old Illuminati of Bavaria, still in business under a new name. And Jules Verne was one of their highest initiates. Hey, you're getting real heavy secret stuff tonight. This is what you paid for, I trust. <laughs> and one of the major secrets of the Priory of Zion is that the Earth is hollow, contrary to what profane science thinks. The Earth is hollow, and there's an opening that goes right down to the center of the Earth. I've read the Chateau in southern France near the Spanish border, 
as a church there. It's called the Church of Mary Magdalene. And it says over the door, this place is terrible. And if you go down to the <laughs> cellar of that church and press the right brick at the right time, uh, uh, a staircase opens leading down. And you go right down to the center of the earth, which is full of superhuman beings who are immortal, who never die. They have the secret of immortality. And they are going to give it to the human race when we're ready for it. But we're not ready for it yet. But the purpose of the Priory of Science is to get us ready for it. Okay. <laughs> you know how many Freemasons it takes to change a light bulb? <laughs> That's a craft secret. <laughs> The uh, Michael Levay's theory that the Priory of Zion are allied with immortal superhuman beings who live in the center of the hollow earth, and you can get in through a uh, door in that church, the Church of Mary Magdalene in Rendle Chateau. That's only, uh, actually, that may not be the whole truth. I hate to disillusion you, but just because you buy a book in a New Age bookstore doesn't mean that everything in it is true. Uh, if you buy one of my books, at least half of it is actually crazy. I, I, I believe, uh, well, my attitude towards the readers is an absolutely sadistic one. In the sense that I'm not to use the word. E. Cummings said to Ezra Pound once, you damned sadist, I can see what you're up to. You're trying to force your readers to think. Well, that is a pretty sadistic thing to do. <laughs> if you go to school, the first thing they teach you is to stop thinking. All children are born, as uh, Buckminster Fuller noticed, uh, all children are born naked, hungry, and intensely curious. And uh, as soon as they start talking, well, even before they start talking, being a parent uh, consists chiefly of following them around the house, showing, don't put that in your mouth. <laughs> That's because the oral bio-survival circuit turns on right after birth, and the first thing they want is mommy's titty. And the second thing they want is to test the rest of the world to see if it's as good as mommy's titty. <laughs> <laughs> this is as good as mommy's titty. Now, you know what the carpet tastes like, right? <laughs> Of course, everybody here goes with the carpet tastes like because you put it in your mouth. You know what the dirt and the flower pot tastes like? You know what everything tastes like. Because this is the first circuit of the nervous system that's activated. If you want to know about the other seven circuits, buy my book, Prometheus Rising. That's what I'm here for, is to sneak in subtle little plugs from my books. Don't no more. Uh, the... As soon as they learn to talk, as, uh, as I was saying, uh, they stop testing everything by putting it in their mouth and they try to find out by wiggling their mouth and they figure out these sounds that grown-ups make have meaning. They start asking questions. And uh, parenting then consists of saying, well, gee, I don't know, I'll go look it up in the encyclopedia. <laughs> they find the most fascinating questions. Why is the sky blue? Uh, well, gee, it's always been blue as far back as I can remember. Uh, maybe it's full of orgone energy. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Why is the sky blue? Well, it's the reflection of lakes and oceans. Uh, no, wait a minute. And, uh, and then the next one, why does it rain? Well, there's, uh, there's excess moisture in the clouds, I think, or something like that. But then they want to know, uh, why is America here and not in Africa? Well, uh, <laughs> and uh, the function of the public school system is to put a stop to that. If we had a population uh, who kept the curiosity of small children. People would be going around trying to find out everything for themselves. And uh, such intense curiosity is likely to tumble the whole edifice of uh, authoritarian society. There's a bridge in Amsterdam. Well, there are a lot of bridges in Amsterdam, <laughs> aren't there? Yeah. There's one particular bridge in Amsterdam. You go over it and you find yourself on E-Tunnel. And there's a great coffee house there, which has a sign in it that says, No hard drugs, please, which I love. <laughs> it's, the, it's so civilized, it's so natalant, it's, it's the essence of Dutchness. No hard drugs, please. <laughs> Isn't that polite? It reminds me of when Nancy Reagan was popularizing Just Say No. 
<laughs> and Timothy Leary said, we can be more polite than Republicans, say, no, thank you. <laughs> and I said, no, hot drugs, please. This is a, a typical Amsterdam coffee house, which means that you can buy a hashish cigarette with your coffee which does do a lot to add to the flavor of coffee. <laughs> and it does a lot for the chocolate buns, too. Uh, but no hard drugs, please. That's, uh, that's so civilized and, and Dutch. Because really, you're sitting around in one of those nice Amsterdam coffee shops with a bunch of friends drinking coffee, blowing bad, <coughs> relaxed, at peace with the world. Uh, you think, uh, gee, every, every, someday the whole world will be like Amsterdam. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. And you don't want somebody in the corner or looking at work, something they ready to shove the needle in. It lowers the whole tone of the So no hard drugs, please. Uh, I love Amsterdam. But anyway, there's the bridge you cross over there. It says under the bridge, abuse of authority comes as no surprise. <laughs> One of the most profound political statements I have ever encountered. Abuse of authority comes as no surprise. And authority cannot survive questioning, especially authority that's based on nothing but bluff. And since governments are based principally on force and deception, Democratic governments are based chiefly on deception, other governments on force. In democratic governments, if you get too uppity, they give up on the deception and they resort to brute force again, as a lot of us found out in the 60s. Those who didn't find out in the 60s will find out in the 90s, because we're going to have a rerun of the 60s. And uh, so they don't want people going around asking questions. So the question is, how do you stop this natural human curiosity? and this incredible intelligence that humans are born with. All humans seem born with a very high IQ compared to chimpanzees, orangutans, dogs, cats, etc. Uh, like a dog. You've noticed that dogs don't have any sense of time whatsoever. You know, you go out the door and you remember you forgot your wallet and you go back in and the dog's, ah, I thought you'd never come back, I thought you'd never come back. <laughs> thank God you're back, thank God you're back. You never did worry how to use the can opener. I thought I'd never see the whole again. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's the same if you've been gone for two weeks, you know. <laughs> thought I'd never see you again. <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, cats are cool. Cats. cats. Did you ever see a cat walk right into a glass uh, uh, French door? You know, a cat will walk right into a blanket. And uh, they won't admit they were surprised. <laughs> so their, whole, their whole career depends on seeming smarter than dogs. Beings <laughs> <laughs> feel inferior. The whole cat shtick is look how imperturbable I am. Look how cool and serene. You want to know Boone is a man? Like <laughs> So a cat walks into the glass, bang, turns around. I meant that, I intended that. I don't want people to think stupid. I know what I'm doing. You follow the cat, you see it's hiding behind the couch going, <laughs> <laughs> so public schools were founded and uh, human IQ began decreasing immediately. There, was, there were actually studies done quoted in Paul Goodman's book, Growing Up Absurd. Paul Goodman, Growing Up Absurd. Just so you don't think I'm making this up. There have actually been studies done in many schools in, in uh, the big cities where IQ measurably decreases from the entering of grammar school to the graduation from high school. The longer they're there, the dumber they get. And uh, uh, some people think that's an accident or an oversight or a mistake. But that is the function of the public school. The function of the public schools is to stop thinking. The idea is to teach people the citizen level of intelligence. They want us to go back before the primate level I see a few puzzled frowns. Citizen comes from the Latin. <laughs> it means uh, to repeat like a parrot. Uh, Citizenism is the habit of repeating whatever you hear. All brainwashing movements are based on getting people to repeat things together. 
like Sig Heil, Sig Heil, Sig Heil, or uh, there's a right wing nut on the radio down in LA named Wally something or other. I can't even remember his Wally last name. Wally, Wally George. George. I can't even remember his last name. I, you turn him on, and the first thing you hear, he's got this uh, record which simulates a live audience. And uh, he made this damn record himself, you know. <laughs> and there's like, a whole bunch of voices chanting, Wally, Wally, Wally. And you suddenly realize it's the same beat. Sing Heil, Sing Heil, Sing Heil. It's the same old trick. And he comes on and starts raving, This is a Christian country. I think all the non Christians should be thrown out of the country right now. Then he gets phone calls and insults everybody who disagrees with him. And then he plays, Wally, Wally, Wally. You think, Jesus, I lived through this in the 30s. What's going on here? Uh, the people, after eight years of grammar school and four years of high school, most people are ready for that sort of thing because they have been taught you never think, you never judge, you never trust your senses, you never report what you see, hear, smell, or any way surmise from the environment. You repeat what the teacher tells you. If they catch you thinking, you get a lower mark. I, uh, I one time got a C on a term paper at Brooklyn Polytechnic. It was the longest term paper in the whole class. I checked that out. It had more footnotes than any other paper. They were all accurate footnotes, all the proper apparatus of scholarship. And why did I get a C? I asked the teacher, why did I get such a low mark? These guys are all these little short papers, got A's, and I get a C for this big, long philosophical paper. He said, engineers don't write like that. You must have plagiarized it. He caught me thinking. That's the one thing they can't stand, is if they catch you thinking, they've got to find some excuse to punish you. You're not supposed to think. You're supposed to repeat what you hear. And almost all books are written on that principle. Books are written, this is the truth. I have found out the truth. I will not explain it in chapter one. I'll explain a little more in chapter two. In chapter three, I'll summarize chapter one and chapter two to make sure you get it. Then in chapter four, I'll tell you a little more. Then in chapter five, I'll repeat it a different way. Then in chapter six, I'll tell it to you again. Now you better believe it. I've proven it. Now go and tell all your friends to buy this book so they'll learn the truth too. And people who have been through our educational system, they think, uh, they think they're thinking when they're, just, when they're just repeating like parrots. So I set out to sabotage the whole system by writing books that nobody can believe. <laughs> you believe one part, you take any book of mine and you believe the first 30 pages, you can't believe the next 30 pages. <laughs> If you somehow make a synthesis between them on some upper Hegelian level, this is the thesis, this is the antithesis, and somehow I'll make a synthesis up here, you find the next 30 pages throw you into an entirely different reality tunnel. By the time you get to the end, you don't know whether, when I'm kidding and when I'm telling the truth. And perforce, you either have to start thinking, which is how people end up in seminars like this, <laughs> where they throw the book across the room and they say, what's this son of a bitch up to? I think he should be banned. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is my whole approach. And it horrifies me that somebody, uh, that somebody might believe something I've written. Because I know how fallible I am. I've had to live with myself for 58 years, and I know what a schmuck I can be. And the thought that somebody's going to set me up as an idol and say it must be true because Robin Anton Wilson wrote it, that is such a terrifying thought <laughs> that I perforce had to invent this style of paradox and play to prevent people from thinking they're getting the truth out of my books. What you're getting out of my books is my guesses, my hunches, sometimes my prejudices. Uh, but I don't know. Unlike the Pope, the Ayatollah, uh, Roger Nish, Carl Sagan, and all the other prophets of all the various. Uh, I don't claim to know the truth. All I claim to know is little hunks of what I've experienced and guesses I've made. Like I, I guess there's a world external to my brain. I can't prove it. But it seems more reasonable because I have pretty good luck most of the time when I'm writing and I want a cup of coffee. I have pretty good, look at, uh, pretty good luck at getting up from the word processor, out the door, down the hall, into the kitchen, to the coffee machine, and bringing back coffee. And I don't think that would work as often as it does if there were no real world out there. 
I know there are philosophers who can prove there is no real world out there, but I find it more convenient to assume that there is. I also assume I don't know anything about it, uh, except how to find the coffee. Uh, beyond that, it gets more and more perplexing and confusing. Uh, <clears throat> For instance, according to Girard de Sade's La Rasse Fabuleuse, published uh, in Paris in 1973, uh, de Chien J. Louis, and my French is lousy, you don't have to tell me. I do better at German, a little better. Uh, I saw a sign uh, going through uh, Bavaria in November, uh, looking out the window, I'm reading all the street signs in the towns we're going to, trying to translate them, and of course German street names are very long, and they're starting to blur in my head because some of them go by so fast I can't translate them in my German. It's not that great that I can translate them. I start seeing all these weird things. Finally, I saw one that said, Heilige Fliegende Kinderscheißestrasse. <laughs> I said, oh no, that can't be. But it was 10, 20 miles back by then. <laughs> I'm having it back there, find that could there possibly be a Heilige Fliegende Kinderscheißestrasse? <laughs> Those of you who speak German explain that to me. <laughs> Gerard de Sade, La Rasse Fabuleuse. Uh, 1973, also deals with the Priory of Sion. He explains that the works of Nostradamus do not deal with the future. Most people think Nostradamus deals with the future, which makes for a lot of puzzles because if you start studying the history of interpretations of Nostradamus, you find everything in Nostradamus has been interpreted a different way every century. There are quatrains in there that some people thought referred to Napoleon. Then later on, they decided they referred to Bismarck. Then later on, they decided they re no, uh, they decided they referred to Kaiser Wilhelm. Later, it was Winston Churchill or Adolf Hitler. Uh, and then it was Ronald Reagan. And uh, they were all highly ambiguous. Uh, a couple of months ago, had an earthquake here. Uh, before your earthquake, there was a big earthquake panic in Los Angeles because some. Cuckoo let out that he had deciphered one of these mysterious verses of Nostradamus, and it said everybody in Los Angeles was going to get dumped in the Pacific Ocean, oh, going to get shaken like martinis, and then dumped <laughs> in the Pacific Ocean on such and such a day. And a lot of people actually left Los Angeles. I, I read this quatrain from Nostradamus, and it seemed to me it could refer to any city any day in any natural calamity. It wasn't even necessarily an earthquake. It could have referred to a cyclone in Miami. But people got terrorized and fled to Los Angeles, which is all to the good. It's too crowded down there anyway. <laughs> the only thing to be said for Malathion spraying is that it's going to thin out the population. <laughs> Those with the less hardy genes will die. The tough ones will survive. Uh, according to the said, uh, this a simulation of prophecy in Nostradamus is all a big hoax. This is just to keep Nostradamus in print by attracting the superstitious and gullible. Meanwhile, as long as Nostradamus is in print, what he actually deals with is not the future, but the past. What Nostradamus' quatrains refer to is the hidden history of the past, especially the past of France. And the hidden history of the past of France, as Gerard de Sud deciphers it, from Nostradamus' plot trains, is full of the most amazing things you've never heard of before. The old royal family of France, the Merovingians, uh, I will not attempt the French pronunciation at all. I will not even make an effort at it. I'll, the English called them Merovingians, and I can pronounce that, so they're Merovingians for tonight. The French royal family up until the 8th to the 9th century, the Merovingians, disappeared entirely Nobody knows what became of them. The last Merovingian king, Dagobert II, was murdered in the Ardennes forest on December 23rd, 789. Why December 23rd? Oh, well. No, I don't want to get into that. Uh, uh, the, uh, why the Ardennes forest, which is named after a bear goddess? No, we shouldn't get into that either. That'll, that'll just lead us down by, into further obscurity. The, uh, 
And the Merovingian Bay disappeared for several hundred years from history. He was considered one of the mythical kings until somebody in the 18th century at the dawn of modern historical uh, science, when they went back to original text and compared one text with another and started applying scientific method to history, they proved Dagobert really existed. Why was he murdered and why was he obliterated from history for several hundred years? Well, according to Girard, this said, the Merovingians were systematically wiped out by the Vatican. The Vatican had to get rid of all the Merovingians because the Merovingians posed a serious threat to them. The Merovingians were descended from the tribe of Benjamin in ancient Israel and Old Testament days and their mates who were not human. The tribe of Benjamin intermarried with extraterrestrials from a planet in the system of the Syria, the star Sirius. And uh, the Orthodox Hebrews drove them out of Israel for this abominable sin of mating with extraterrestrials. They moved to Arcadia in Greece, which they named after a bear goddess. And then they moved to the Ardennes region in France, which they named after another bear goddess. That's B-E-A-R, not B-A-R-E. Uh, although Artemis, whose name means bear in Greek, was a bear goddess, and a bear goddess, if you read the Acteon legend. Uh, the, uh, the descendants of this uh, intermarriage between extraterrestrials from Sirius and ancient Israelites became the Merovingian dynasty, who have superhuman powers and long hair that goes, goes down the back of their neck and down the back of their spine. And uh, the Vatican tried to wipe them all out, but a few of them still survive. And they and their allies make up the Priory of Sion a secret society devoted to bringing the science of Sirius to Earth when we're ready for it. Now that's a little bit different than the theory in Michael LeMay's book, isn't it? Uh, that's another reason I don't claim to tell the truth. I don't know how to find out the truth. I just collect theories and guess which one of them sounds more plausible. So far, neither of these sound very plausible to me, but I like the one about Sirius because there was a period in 1973 when I was getting communications from Sirius, or thought I was, and then in 1974 my friend Phil Dick started getting communications from Sirius too, or thought he was, and uh, so I've always been intrigued with Sirius. Oh, I eventually decided I wasn't getting communications from Sirius. A psychic named Penny Looney told me I was channeling an ancient Chinese philosopher. And I started to try to make tests to see whether it was an extraterrestrial from Sirius or a Chinese philosopher. And I found either one worked. And I found this to seem to fit the data, just like the wave and particle models and quantum mechanics. And then another psychic told me I was channeling a medieval Irish bard, which made a lot of sense to me because I've always been attracted to the medieval Irish poetry. And if a medieval Irish bard was trying to use me as a channel all my life, I wouldn't. That's why I would have gotten so involved with Irish uh, literature. Uh, but then I saw the movie Harvey, <laughs> which is about a uh, fellow named Elwood P. Dowd in some city in Ohio, who comes out of a bar one night and meets a six-foot-tall white rabbit lounging against the lamppost. And the rabbit says to him, "How are you this evening, Mr. Dowd?" And in the movie, when Elwood tells this to the psychiatrist, his sister has taken him to the psychiatrist says, weren't you surprised? And Elwood says, no, it's a small town. Everybody knows my name. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, the six-foot-tall white rabbit is, a, is well known in County Kerry. He's called the Puka, uh, which some... Uh, Linguist claims the earliest Indo-European form of the word, which became bog in Russian and God in English, is the, it means the divinity, the divinity. The earliest divinity of Europe was a giant rabbit, according to some theories. And this giant rabbit still survives in County Kerry, where in modern Gaelic he's called the Puka. And occasionally some of them wander as far as Ohio, in <laughs> that play. There's a skeptical psychiatric orderly in the play named Wilson. And he looks up puka in the dictionary, and the, dic and the definition he finds in the dictionary is puka, n, a Celtic elf or vegetation spirit, wise but mischievous, fond of rum pots, crack pots, and how are you tonight, Mr. Wilson? 
<laughs> well, when I saw that on television, I thought, oh my God, I'm, not, I'm like Phil Tech, the television is talking to me. <laughs> so I decided to experimentally take the attitude that what was communicating with me or through me was a six foot tall white rabbit from County Kerry. And I found that made as much sense as assuming it was an extraterrestrial or an ancient Chinese philosopher or a medieval Irish bard. So I adopted the six foot tall white rabbit from Kerry because there was absolutely no danger that I might take that literally. And I think when you're dealing with these processes, the worst danger is what the Sufis call literalism. Never be literable, literal, literal. Oh my God. Ovular. There's an ovular shape on the floor. There is no such word as ovular. He denies that there's such a word as ovular. Put that in the book. You recognize that? That's from Wesson Wells' version of the trial. Uh, uh, if you don't like the six foot tall white rabbit from County Kerry, you can call it the left, uh, the right hemisphere of the brain. Or you can call it the collective unconscious. Anyway, the, uh, whether I was getting messages from Sirius or from my own unconscious or the collective unconscious, or what lies even deeper than the collective unconscious according to Jung, the psychoid level, which is the same in all animals, not just in humans, and it's also the same in inanimate matter as it is in animate matter, and it has the quantum characteristic of non-locality, so it, it includes all space and all time, which explains why you often get precognition on this level, uh, which is why Jung calls synchronicity. One student of Jung tells about a time at the Jung Institute when they were having one of these incredible coincidences after another, the student said to Jung, I can't understand all this. And Jung said, it's just synchronicity. And then the next day there was more of it. The student says, how can, how can the synchronicity keep on happening like this? Jung said, okay, it's demons. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my approach is it's the, it's the non-local level of mind as described by the great quantum physicist Evan Harris Walker in his paper, The Complete Quantum Anthropologist. And anybody who can understand the mathematics in Walker's paper, it's a six foot tall white rabbit from County <laughs> Kerry. That you can understand, right? Just don't take it literally. Anyway, uh, there's a church in uh, Stenay, uh, which was uh, one of the capitals of the Merovingian dynasty, which is oriented so that if you stand by the altar and look out the door in the summer, you'll see Sirius framed right in the doorway leading into the church. And uh, Descent compares this to the Church of Mary Magdalene in Rendlish Chateau, in which the 14 stations of the cross have many oddities which have never been explained. For instance, there's a Scotchman in kilts watching the crucifixion. You will not find this in either the Christian Bible or in any of the Gnostic Bibles. You'll also find some people carrying Jesus out of the tomb in the middle of the night, as if he didn't die at all. They were about to fake a resurrection. And it says over the door, this place is terrible. Well, according to, uh, this, this was built by a uh, a priest named Father Saunier in the 1890s. Uh, according to the side, uh, the, these 14 stations of the cross contain coded references like Nostradamus that shows that the royal family of France is descended partly from Sirius and possess superhuman powers. And there are hints that we'll have peace in Europe and apparently in the whole world. Once these superhuman beings are allowed to rule us again, after all the mistakes of the last two centuries are undone, and all these democratic follies are put aside, and we accept these superhuman beings who have come here just to help us, and I say, gee, that, that bullshit sounds familiar. We haven't heard that before. We've been hearing that since the Stone Age about various types who have a desire to rule. Oh, we're not humans like you are. We're descended from the sun god. That's what the, that's what the Aztecs said. That's what the Inca said in Peru. That's what the Hiro, uh, Hirohito was the last one to claim that, and he was buried. God is dead. Ever since Hirohito was buried, we got no more gods on this planet. He was the last one. Well, no, no, no we still had Rajanish, didn't we? After, after Rajanish was buried, well, suddenly we were left on our own. We've got to figure it out for ourselves now. 
Well, maybe another guy will pop up somewhere. 73, when uh, La Russe Fabulous was published, a Swiss journalist named Matthew Powley published a book called Undercurrents of Political Ambition. And he got interested in the Priory of Sion because he found their newsletter circuit was being distributed through the lodges of the Grand Loge Alpina, the largest Masonic Brotherhood in uh, Switzerland. As a matter of fact, the Grand Loge Alpina contains the bankers uh, who own the banks in Zurich and Basel, uh, who pretty much control European finance. And there's as many conspiracy theories about the Grand Loge Alpina over in Europe as there are about the uh, Bohemian Club over here. These are the richest people in Europe, and they belong to the secret Masonic group, the Grand Loge Alpina. Harold Wilson, no relative. He was a prime minister in England back before Thatcher, if anybody can remember a time before <laughs> Thatcher, way back in the dark ages there in the 70s. Harold Wilson called them the Gnomes of Zurich. As far as I know, he was the only one that ever pronounced the G in Gnomes. <laughs> We call them the Gnomes of Zurich. He complained that no matter what any government in Europe tried to do, if the Gnomes of Zurich didn't like it, they'd stop it one way or another. And as a matter of fact, governments don't act. Governments only react. The bankers make the decisions, and then governments decide how are we going to adjust to this. Government can't do anything unless a bank gives them the money to do it. And if the, uh, the bank says, we'll give you this much money for building armaments, the government will build armaments because they can't get any money out of the bankers any other way. If the banks say, we don't want you to build armaments anymore, we want you to build highways, they'll build highways. So people will wonder or worry about who's president, whether it's Bush or Quayle or, or pubic hair or, or anus or whatever. The important thing is who's running the banks? They're the ones who are making the decisions. Anyway, the Grand Loge Alpina was distributing this uh, literature from the Priory of Sion, which said on the inside of the front cover that it was published by the Committee to Secure the Rights and Liberties of Low-Cost Housing. <laughs> uh, Matthew Powley, the Swiss journalist, got interested in the Committee to Secure the Rights and Privileges of Low-Cost Housing because he detected in the Priory of Sion publications that there was something that was not exactly centered on low-cost housing. There seemed to be a strong implication that there were superhuman beings in Europe who were waiting for their turn to take over and solve all of our problems for us. Uh, Pauli started investigating, and he found that there was the uh, circuit was not published by the Committee to Secure the Rights and Privileges of Low-Cost Housing, it was published out of the office of the Committee of Public Safety of the de Gaulle government in Paris, which was run by André Malraux, great novelist and art historian, and Pierre Plantard, uh, the St. Clair, who uh, is related to the St. Clairs of Scotland, who have been connected with masonry since about the 13th century, and played a major role in the development of uh, European masonry. And it turns out that Pierre Plantard de Sinclair is the, was then the Grand Master of the Priory of Sion. Uh, Pauli decided that the Priory of Sion was a conspiracy within the de Gaulle government intended to restore monarchy in France and perhaps establish a Europe-wide empire with one emperor at the top like Napoleon had tried to do. A year after this book was published, Pauli was shot as a spy in Israel. That must be a coincidence. <laughs> a, magazine, a French magazine, uh, after these three books came out, a French magazine whose name I don't remember, but you can look it up in Holy Blood, Holy Grail, they did their own study of the Priory of Sion, and they just they claim that Archbishop Lefebvre was the head of it. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre was the guy who, for about 20 years, was going around denouncing the Vatican, claiming the Vatican had been taken over by Freemasons and Satanists during the reign of Pope John the 23rd, 
and that the Catholic Church was now totally corrupted by Masonic and Satanic influences, and his followers often added to that, he is the man who should be Pope. He never said that himself explicitly, but that's a strong feature in all propaganda put out by Lefebvre groups. They, they put an ad that I mentioned, uh, this ad that was in the Los Angeles paper. I think I mentioned it uh, earlier today. A couple of weeks ago in the LA Times there was an ad that said, Jesus and Mary predict huge earthquake for LA. And this ad explained that Los Angeles is going to have a bigger earthquake than you had up here, much bigger. And the only way to survive is by hanging a crucifix on your door, buying a rosary, and getting a copy of the Catholic Bible translated before 1965. That's, uh, that's before Vatican II. Uh, this is a key thing with the Lefebvre people, is that everything since 1965, everything that's come out of the Vatican since 1965 has been the work of Freemasons and Satanists. And Lefebvre is the only one who's maintaining the true Catholic Church. And he got away with this for over 20 years. Last year they abruptly excommunicated him. For years I was wondering, why don't they excommunicate this guy? <laughs> I mean, he's marching up and down Europe, as it were. He's publishing all, he's got all these followers putting out all these hysterical publications announcing the Vatican is run by Satanists. And they, and they just ignore him. Well, after 20 years, they stopped ignoring him and they excommunicated him, which means that he got more publicity and more followers, naturally. Maybe that's why it took them so long to excommunicate him. He's got a group in Long Island called Our Lady of the Flowers. If you write to them, you will get two rose petals blessed by Jesus Christ himself and a lot of propaganda about why Jesus wants you to kill homosexuals. <laughs> Jesus is really pissed at the gay men. He's got a real thing. He's off his head on the subject. That's why he's sending the fucking earthquake. <laughs> That's, well, this is what the Lefebvre people believe. One of his disciples, Father Wohn Kron, who was, as uh, a matter of fact, ordained by Lefebvre himself, he tried to shoot the Pope in Fatima a couple of years ago. Bang, 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 and he missed. Uh, well, priests are not trained. Uh, he, said, he said at his trial that, uh, in cross-examination, the uh, prosecutor said, you show no remorse whatsoever. Do you feel no sense of guilt? And he said, I have absolutely no guilt about trying to kill the Antichrist. My only guilt is that I committed some sins of the flesh when I was younger. He's <laughs> guilty <laughs> <laughs> about that 20 years later. He doesn't mind shooting somebody. <laughs> uh, In uh, 1981 appeared Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which at last revealed the actual truth. <laughs> <laughs> the Priory of Sion is a medieval chivalric order devoted to protecting the descendants of the Merovingian dynasty. And the reason they are being protected against the continuous attempts of the Vatican to get rid of them all is not that they are descended from people from Sirius, but that they are descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a son named Merove who emigrated to France, and the Merovingian dynasty is descended from him. And as a matter of fact, Holy Blood, Holy Grail gives you genealogies of all sorts of people descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, including Otto von Habsburg. <laughs> Now, Otto von Habsburg was one of the founders of the Bilderbergers. I trust you for, you're, playing, you're paying close attention at this point. It gets a bit hairy around here. Uh, the Bilderbergers, uh, originally sponsored by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, was also on the charts in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. He's also descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, if you believe this theory. Prince Bernhard founded the Bilderbergers. Otto von Habsburg has been the chief financier behind it. Otto von Habsburg's grandfather gave several million francs to the priest who built that weird church of Mary Magdalene in Rennes-le-Chateau with the sign over the door saying this place is terrible and the brick in the cellar that will let you down to the center of hollow earth if you believe the other story. Now I have a friend who was over in Rennes-le-Chateau last year 
and he found a hollow statue in the church. He was looking around to see how many mysteries he could solve. He found this, this is hollow, by God. None of the other investigators have discovered this. I found something on my own. He managed to get the statue open and unscrewed. And inside were some German newspapers from 1904 that have absolutely no relation to any of this stuff. <laughs> At this point, uh, I'm going to tell you, one of the grand masters of the Priory of Science in the 1960s was uh, Jean Cocteau, uh, who was also one of the founders of the Surrealist Movement, the biggest opium head in France, uh, experimented with peyote also. Uh, he, uh, uh, there's a movie Cocteau made with BBC called Portrait of a Poet, and Cocteau insisted on being in on the editing. He was not, it was not just about him, he wanted it to have his own style. There's a scene in there of Cocteau coming out of his house and a policeman stops him, asks him a couple of questions and then lets him walk on. And on the soundtrack you hear Cocteau's voice saying, the poet must always be a suspicious character. The authorities must always worry what he is hatching. <laughs> That's why they have public schools, remember? <laughs> Make sure nobody's hatching anything. We're all just repeating like parrots. Um, my beautiful wife, Arlen, uh, has read some of this literature, not as much as I have, but I keep waving these books at her and say, Jesus Christ, look at this. Isn't this, isn't this fantastic? What do you think about this? And she looked to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and said, oh, it's obvious. I can see it. 1932, a cellar in Paris. Cocteau, Dali, André Breton, <laughs> uh, bunch. They're all sitting around smoking opium. And one of them says, you know, surrealism has pretty much had it. People are getting bored. We can't revive Dada. What are we going to do? And Cocteau takes a long toke. <laughs> Let's overthrow the Catholic Church. <laughs> Well, that's Arlen's theory. <laughs> but the, the priory of science can be proven to be older than Cocteau. It was back at least to the 1890s and probably a couple of centuries before that. Maybe back to the 13th century even, like they claim. There's recently been a book by a Jungian psychologist uh, named Ian Begg <clears throat> called The Cult of the Black Virgin. At least one of these books is actually here to show you I'm not making all this up as I go along. <laughs> oh, here's Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Oh. Ian Begg uh, made a study of the 400 and uh, something more than 400 statues in European churches of the Virgin Mary, in which the Virgin Mary appears to be black or Negro. Now, if, the, if these statues all appeared in the last 40 or 60 years, you might make a good case uh, of attributing them to the Rastafarians. <laughs> the Rastafarians believe that Jesus and his whole family were black. They also believe all the heroes of the Old Testament were black. They got some good biblical references to back this, if you believe that black in the King James Version means black racially. Uh, depends on, there's room for interpretation. But the Rastafarians did not do this. These statues have been there for 700 years. Most of them can be definitely dated to the 13th century. So who did it? Well, according to Ian Begg, the Priory of Sion did it. For some reason in the 13th century, they went all over Europe planting statues to indicate that the, the, house of the, the House of David was black, or at least part of it was black by the time it got to Jesus anyway. Why did they do this? Well, maybe, maybe it was true. Uh, if you take a look at the map, the Near East and Africa are pretty close. There must have been a lot of genetic drift back and forth. Read some of the Rastafarian literature. They'll convince you. They, make, they, they have a lot of good... Ian Begg doesn't go into that. He says black is a symbol of the supreme mystical state. Uh, only the ignorant Buddhists think white light represents the supreme mystical state. The Sufis know that above the white light there's the trance of total blackness, which is the highest trance of all reveals the true nature of everything, which Alistair Crowley described as nothing. The true nature of everything is nothing. <laughs> that is the negative void. You think of a positive void as endless whiteness. 
you got to think of it as endless blackness to get the negative void, the Kabbalistic zero, and that's the true essence of everything, according to the Sufi tradition and according to Aleister Crowley, who, by the way, was associated with the priest who built that church in Rendlish Chateau and says this place is terrible and has the Scotchman in kilts at the crucifixion. <laughs> I probably learned magic from the Gregor Mathers, who uh, was a Scotchman who uh, claimed his family had been Freemasons since the days of the Knights Templar and that he was the reincarnation of King James II, uh, the last Scotch King of England. But that's more or less a digression, don't let it confuse you. I'm trying kind to of make this as simple as possible. The, uh, Ian Beck, yeah, the cult of the Black Virgin. Uh, the Priory of Sign put these statues all over Europe. As a matter of fact, there's one in Dublin. Uh, Our Lady of Dublin is black. I've actually seen her. And like all the other black virgins around Europe, she was lost and refound. Almost every one of these black statues, there's a legend about how she got lost and then miraculously was recovered. Our Lady of Dublin was found in a blacksmith's yard after being lost for 200 years. Genesis. Uh, this fellow studies the geometry of that church in Renlis Chateau in relation to the geometry of the surrounding area. You see, he manages to make pentagons, he manages to make spirals, all sorts of interesting patterns. Yeah, there's, this is the one he calls the vagina of Nuit. Nuit was the Egyptian star goddess. Uh, this illustrates the first lure of uh, lay hunters which is that any group of churches and prehistoric megaliths can be connected into an interesting geometrical pattern if you use a small enough map and a thick enough pencil. <laughs> he uses a small enough map and a thick enough pencil to get the most interesting diagrams I've ever seen in any of these lay hunting books. And he proves, once he's got his diagrams of the relation of the church to the prehistoric megaliths uh, and various stars, he proves that France was settled by people from Atlantis. When Atlantis sank, some of the survivors got to France and they kept alive the tradition of how the human race was created. The human race was created by an extraterrestrial named Satan. Satan was not an angel at all, he was an extraterrestrial. And we've all got his genetic strain. So we are all children of Satan. <laughs> and once we recognize that, we will be liberated and ready for the next revelation from outer space. Now you got to admit, <laughs> you got to admit, <laughs> some people are stupid, some people are batshit crazy, and some are just full of shit. you got to admit, this is much better bullshit than you get from Ramtha. <laughs> Ramtha has been dead 40,000 years and hasn't had an original thought in all that time. <laughs> You can't get anything from Romp that you can't get from Hallmark reading cards. <laughs> well, or the editorials in Reader's Digest. This stuff is original and provocative. This stuff might actually come from extraterrestrials. At least it shows a, a, a rather uh, transhuman sense of humor and a definite attempt to adjust our minds in such a way that we are no longer sure that we fully understand the difference between poetry and reality, which is another reason for suspecting Cocteau was the main architect. Uh, but this, this, this does enlarge the mind, liberate the energies, and create an acute case of paranoia when you trace all the people on that the Merovingian chart, like Otto von Habsburg is the president of the Society for the United States of Europe, They've been working for decades to create a united Europe, which is about to appear. Just when they're about to do it, the whole Eastern Bloc breaks loose from Russia. Why did Gorbachev let them break loose? Who's dealing with who behind the scenes? What has this got to do with the gnomes of Zurich? <laughs> they put up the financing before any major political change can occur. What has this got to do with the pay Do group in Italy? pay Do was using the Vatican Bank to launder most of the cocaine money from South America and most of the heroin money from the Near East. The heroin money came by way of the Grey Wolves, one of whom, Mehmet Ali Aja, 
ran the money through the Banco Ambrosiano in Milan, which was owned by the Vatican Bank. He tried to shoot the Pope, remember, in St. Peter's Square? It's funny how many people try to kill this Pope. It's like a mafia family, isn't it? Uh, I tell you what, I think it's time we had a break. Everybody get up, stretch, go outside, get some fresh air. If you need it. Then I'll continue with uh, the Pei Duay story and its connections with George Bush and Quail. Well. Well. Right. <laughs> While I was signing books with some other people, and it got a bit chaotic, but it did uh, suggest to me that people have a lot of questions. Now I have to leave at 8.30 because I have to catch a plane. So I think I will put the uh, question, I think I will put a question period in here. And if things work out, okay, I'll put another question period in just before I leave. After I go through the uh, Vatican Bank, I don't know, okay, the center of the ocean, and all the bones, and so on. But right now, those of you who are absolutely desperate to ask questions, here's your chance. Yes? Um, the future availability of the Pulse Star? Uh, the Pulse Star, uh, the inventor died. Uh, it is now being manufactured under the name New Star. And I have not got the uh, manufacturer's address memorized. You will have to start out with that full New Star and wrap it down yourself. Okay. It's the best I can do. Yes. Being you were once an editor of Playboy, do you have any comments on Hugh's recent marriage? <laughs> Boy, that's tenuous. Uh, <laughs> seeing as I once lived in Chicago, do I have any comments on the current mayor? Uh, son of Richard Daly. It sounds like the greatest horror movie ever. <laughs> I had enough of Richard Daly in the 60s. You have to, so you have to get married. Well, uh, I can't think of a damn comment to make about it. But I have what I said before. <laughs> You mentioned in your book, uh, it's up on the shelf, Cosmic Trigger, that you, know, you want to be more, but at least we're looking into the, the new technologies. Is it worth it anymore? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it ever was. If it ever was, it still is. It depends on what your picture of the future is. Yeah. And my picture of the future is uh, uh, uninhibitedly optimistic. I think we're in a period of fractal chaos in which the whole, whole system is uh, collapsing and uh, every week is a new surprise, like they just let Nelson Mandela out in South Africa. Yeah. And in Romania, the most terrible of all the dictatorships, they killed the, the dictator and his wife and then passed the law against capital punishment and didn't let it go on. Like it does in most revolutions, executions upon executions until they create a counter-revolutionary class out of the relatives of all the people who got killed. Uh, and uh, four people have been found guilty of genocide and sentenced to life in prison instead of being executed. That's a real surprise in the history of revolutions. And uh, we're getting one surprise after another. And I think this is the period of fractal chaos in which the old system is uh, giving way to the new system. Of course, uh, the fractal chaos has backward as well as forward movements. And right now, right now in Southern California, where I live, they're conducting the biggest experiment ever conducted on human beings since Nazi Germany. Uh, I, I have strong suspicions that Dr. Mengler has taken over the state of California. <laughs> and they are dumping malathion on people every night down there just to see what happens. If enough of us survive, they'll have scientific proof that it's safe. Right now, they don't have any. They only have proof that people can survive one dose. They have no proof that people can survive repeated doses. So if enough of us survive, they'll have proof. And if enough of us don't survive, they'll say, oh, well, gee, I guess we fucked up again. <laughs> what do you expect the government's in any way? <laughs> yes? Given the situation in Russia, do you suspect that the Kremlin has been infiltrated by the Scordians? <laughs> uh, in a sense, I, I, um, Bucky Fuller said in 1981 that the, uh, the technologists were going to take over Russia. 
And their attitude is nobody can win a nuclear war, so the first thing to do is to abolish the possibility of nuclear war and then introduce uh, the uh, Western-style bourgeois freedoms that the communists have always rejected because scientists need that for their work. And of course, Gorbachev was a good friend of Sakharov, and Gorbachev does get a lot of support from that part of Russian society. So it's sort of a tech, uh, it's a technocratic revolution, but uh, technocrats tend to be discordians anyway, so to overlap. Yes? What's the origin of the word Fedor? I would get out of here alive if I told you. <laughs> I'll quote you from the Gospel of Thomas, which is the earliest of all Gospels, earlier than any that got into the Bible. It's dated, uh, it's probably written right after the death of uh, the late Redeemer, and uh, probably by his twin brother. At least according to one version, uh, Thomas means twin. Uh, it's just the Gospel of uh, Judah, Thomas, and uh, that probably means Judah, the brother, uh, the twin brother. Uh, or at least that's one interpretation of it. In there, um, Jesus uh, tells something to Thomas, and the other apostles say, what did he whisper to you that he didn't want the rest of us to hear? And Thomas said, if I told you, you would pick up stones and kill me. Next question. <laughs> yeah. uh, you already had a question. Yeah. Uh, You've made a lot of very optimistic predictions in the past. Uh, a lot of people seem to have predictions about the time frame uh, of the changes that we seem to be in. Do you have a, a latest prediction uh, regarding the time frame? And to quote Robert Heinlein, it does not pay a profit to be too specific. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, things have been happening so fast lately. When I started, I did a European tour in November. When I started the tour, people were saying the Berlin Wall is going to come down within 10 years. When I finished the tour, people were saying, which week will it be? When I got back here, the wall came down already. I got a piece of the wall on my mantelpiece sent to me by a friend in Berlin. Things are happening so fast that the only prediction I'll make is that everything is going to happen faster than we expected. <coughs> okay, any more questions? Yes? Where is Gregory Hill and what's he up to? Uh, uh, Gregory Hill is the head of a large computer facility uh, owned by one of the largest banks in the United States. He's not writing anymore. Running this big computer uh, complex is keeping him busy enough and he's still the same whimsical, surrealist character which makes me wonder what's happening to the banking system. Kerry <laughs> <laughs> Thornley? Uh, Kerry Thornley is still sending out uh, long uh, documents explaining that he killed John Kennedy while under hypnosis by the CIA and I was his CIA babysitter and I only deny it because all CIA agents deny what they did. <laughs> and I thank him for the publicity. <laughs> Make Russell charged in Conspiracy Digest that I am a paid agent of the Rockefeller Conspiracy. In the next issue of Conspiracy Digest, I confess that it was true. Nelson, uh, I mean David, uh, I, I, I said Nelson because when Illuminatus first came out, I was disappointed that Dell wasn't doing enough advertising and I didn't have a budget myself. So I figured, what can I afford to do? So I had a rubber stamp made. And I put it on all my letters, and wherever I went, if I, there wasn't a comp looking, I put it on the billboard, I put it on toilet paper, in the men's room, in the movie theaters. <laughs> Everywhere I went, I put this rubber stamp and said, Why is Nelson Rockefeller never seen in public without his trousers? Read Illuminatus. <laughs> that would arouse a lot of curiosity. It just goes to show artists never understand the depth of their own inspiration or how the collective unconscious works because when Nelson Rockefeller died, he didn't have his trousers on, as you may remember. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, in my confession in Conspiracy Digest, I said May Russell was right. 
David Rockefeller comes around every week and gives me a bar of solid gold, and my whole cellar is stacked from floor to ceiling with these bars of Rockefeller gold. And then I ended woof, woof, woof. And I'm sure, knowing May, she was going around showing that letter to people for years, saying, here, he confessed, he it. And he even gives away his extraterrestrial origin. You get that reference to the dog star in there? Okay, well, we will now continue with the evening's entertainment. And I hope you find as many yachts in the second part as you found in the first part. <laughs> Uh, during World War II, a young Italian named Vicio Gelli managed to uh, get himself a position in the communist underground in Italy and a job with the Gestapo at the same time. You will already see that Mr. Gelli was uh, good at uh, fancy footwork. He managed to go through the whole war uh, working for the underground and the Gestapo simultaneously persuading each side that he was betraying the other and actually loyally serving them. Uh, a lot of people went to their deaths because Jelly turned them into the Gestapo. A lot of people did not go to their deaths because Jelly did not turn them into the Gestapo. There was some attempt to bring him to trial as a war criminal at the end of the war, but this was stopped by the numbers of people who came forth and said he helped the underground more than anybody in Italy, so he got off scot-free. He thereupon went to work, set up an office in Rome with a couple of friends who were expert forgers, and created an alternative ID for uh, not wanted Nazi war criminals, most of whom went to Latin America, and Jelly later got them jobs with American intelligence there, among <coughs> them was Klaus Barbie, whom you may have heard of. Uh, Jelly pretty soon staffed uh, the Latin American branch of the CIA with uh, Nazi war criminals, uh, one or two of whom gets caught every year, and the CIA always throws up their hands and say, we didn't know he was a Nazi war criminal, we thought he just looked like that Nazi war criminal. Uh, Jelly uh, officially went to work for the CIA in the 1950s. He was working out of the American Embassy in Rome, according to quite a few witnesses. Uh, one of his first major jobs for the CIA was turning the Italian labor movement away from the left-wing direction it was taking after World War II in a right-wing direction. He accomplished this by a variety of means, one of which was persuading Sophia Loren to star in a television commercial denouncing the left-wing unions and telling everybody to join the right-wing unions, for which Sophia got paid a pretty penny. A pile of lira. Like I told you, you can get movie stars to say anything these <laughs> days. Uh, that didn't pull the, that didn't exactly turn the tide all by itself, so Jelly hired a bunch of his friends in the Mafia to shoot all the uh, heads of the left-wing labor unions in Italy. Uh, who wouldn't take bribes to take uh, more right-wing positions. And so the CIA was very delighted with Mr. Jelly, and he became one of their major European uh, assets, as they say, just like Noriega in Panama, uh, major asset. Around this time, Jelly was uh, recruited by the KGB. Uh, well, why not? If you, uh, if you can convince the Nazis and the Communists you're on the same side during World War II, you can convince the CIA and the Communists you're on by their side during the Cold War. So he was receiving uh, payments from the KGB and the CIA for a variety of projects when he entered the Grand Orient Lodge of Egyptian Freemasonry. The Grand Orient Lodge of Egyptian Freemasonry was founded in 1771 by the Duc d'Orléans, and who had ambitions of becoming king. Uh, Orléans knew that if the right seven people died at the right time, he would succeed to being king. It was just a question of persuading these seven people to die at the right <laughs> times. And uh, as some Italian Renaissance prince victim know that he is pushed by a friend, it is only important that he is dead. <laughs> uh, there are some Italians who felt that you had to know a friend was doing it to you when it happened. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, well, to get into the subtleties of the Roman psyche is a little, <laughs> it goes a little too deep, but you got to read the Maltese for all, can I suppose? Well, anyway, uh, 
Orleans uh, was uh, assisted in founding the Grand Orient Lodge by Count Cagliostro, who, as everybody knows, was actually a Sicilian gypsy named Joseph Balsamo. Everybody knows that who hasn't read Charles Floyd and Colin Wilson, both of whom have pointed out that the identification of Cagliostro with Balsamo was made by one witness, was never proved, and had just been repeated by historians because nobody knows who he really was. And most historians go on the principle that you can find one source that says something and all the other sources don't know anything, we'll just repeat this. Nobody actually knows who Cagliostro was or where he came from except that he seemed to belong to every secret society in Europe, had all their insignias on his robes, knew all their secret grips and passwords, and had a hell of a lot of money which he distributed in poor neighborhoods all over France while he was doing miracle healings using mesmerism. <coughs> and the Grand Orient Lodge became the biggest Masonic Lodge in pre-revolutionary France, and the leaders of the Grand Orient Lodge all ended up the leaders of the new government after the revolution, except for Orléans, who got his head chopped off, which illustrates Wilson's first law of conspiracies. The greatest conspirators are usually the greatest fuck-ups. Orléans did not get what he wanted. He got his head chopped off instead. Cagliostro died in a dungeon in Rome, awaiting trial by the Inquisition. Uh, the Grand Orient Lodge was involved in quite a lot of radical activity through the 19th century, including the Paris Commune of the 1870s. When uh, Jelly entered the Grand Orient Lodge, he ascended to the third degree, which is pretty low, uh, comparatively speaking, because there are 32 degrees. After attaining the third degree, learning the identity of the widow's son, and uh, that of which it is wisest not to speak. Uh, Jelly founded uh, Propaganda Due, which was named after Propaganda Uno, which was a Masonic socialist conspiracy of the 1870s. Except Propaganda Due, unlike Propaganda Uno, was not a socialist conspiracy, it was a fascist conspiracy. He rec recruited most of the remaining fascists in Italy. Uh, and then set about recruiting everybody in a position of power. One of the rules of propaganda due was that you had to write out in handwriting, not on typewriter, you had to write in your own handwriting and give to the Grand Master of the Lodge, Michio Jelly, a complete confession of all your crimes and sins, everything illegal and unethical you had ever done. And because Propaganda Due had acquired the reputation of being the people who were getting into power in Italy, a lot of people wanted to join. So they wrote out these confessions. And this gave Jelly ample opportunity to blackmail people who didn't want to join Pay Due. He called them up and told them what he had in his files and saying, unless you join Pay Due, this goes to the press tomorrow. So in 1981, when Pay Due exploded, into public notice, uh, they discovered there were 451 members of Pei Due in key positions in the Italian government, including the head of the secret police. When the police went to arrest Jelly, he had already left Italy and flown to Uruguay because the head of the secret police had tipped him off, being a member of Pei Due himself. The head of the secret police was indicted for conspiring with GLA to overthrow the government, install a new fascist government, and in the course of this conspiracy, they performed, the investigating magistrates alleged, several terrorist bombings, which they blamed on the Red Brigades to persuade the Italians there was a massive anarchist threat loose in the country and they needed a fascist government to protect them from it. The head of the secret police died before he could be brought to trial. He was a knight of Malta, so was Jelly. The Knights of Malta are an ancient Vatican uh, secret society devoted to trying to put things back to the way they were in the 13th century, more or less. The main purpose of the Knights of Malta is to correct the errors that have crept into the Western world since the rise of Protestantism. Uh, the Western world is full of people who do not, who do not acknowledge the infallibility of the Pope. This is an error. 
uh, the Western world is full of people who believe it's legitimate to overthrow an ordained monarch. This is an error. Uh, the Pope Leo the the faulty findeth, as Joyce calls him. What, what, Leo, what Leo was, what number did he have? Oh, you know the bastard I mean. Leo in the 1870s, he wrote a syllabus of errors, listing all the errors of the modern world. Most of them you'll find in the American Bill of Rights. These are all errors. Freedom of the press is an error. The press only has the freedom to print the truth, and the church defines the truth. The idea that we can print whatever we want is an error. Uh, the function of the Knights of Malta is to undo the Protestant Reformation, undo the democratic revolutions of the 18th century, and reestablish papal control over the whole world, the way it should be, the way Jesus intended it to be when he founded the Catholic Church. You all know Jesus founded the Catholic Church, right? <clears throat> so Jelly was a Knight of Malta, the Chief of the Secret Police was a Knight of Malta, Within Masonry, which the Knights of Malta have been trying to abolish for 200 years, they founded this quasi-Masonic order called Pei Dui. The, uh, the next in line for chief of the secret police, after the, chief, the head of the secret police died, turned out to be a member of Pei Dui also. He, he was brought to trial for conspiracy in the Bologna railway bombing and acquitted. Uh, Jelly, uh, in the early 1970s, had recruited Roberto Calvi, who was a uh, middle rank officer of Banco Brosiano, a bank owned by the Vatican Bank, but operating as a separate organization in Milan. Roberto Calvi believed that power in this world uh, is based on what the Italians call uh, se uh, secret power. All open power is based on secret power that works behind the scenes. Calvi told this to everybody he ever got into a philosophical discussion with. He told it to his son. He told it to other workers at the bank. It was one of his favorite topics when he wasn't recommending The Godfather. Calvi always told everybody, there's only one novel you have to read. <laughs> read The Godfather. That's the book that shows the way the world is really run. The rest of it is all romantic nonsense. So Calvi had a deep passion to find out who held the secret power so he could join them and be on the winning side, which makes a lot of sense if you want to be on the win. I'm always amazed by paranoids who find out who holds the power and then spend all their time fighting with them. If you know who holds the power, the thing to do is join them. If you're going to fight them, you're just going to weigh yourself down, right? Doesn't that make sense? Or do we have some idealists left in the world? <laughs> Well, Calvi joined uh, Propaganda Due and got to be president of Banco Ambrosiano. Nicolae Sindona, who was a lawyer for the Mafia, for several Mafia families in particular in Sicily, he joined Pei Due and got sent over to the United States where he offered Richard Nixon a million dollars for the 1972 campaign which Nixon's people decided to decline because uh, they didn't like uh, the possibility of this being traced back to the Mafia. Whether they ever managed to give the million dollars to Nixon through some subterranean channel, they have been unable to discover. But Sindona was at Nixon's inauguration that year. Sindona founded the Franklin National Bank in this country and uh, shortly thereafter was convicted of 65 counts of stock and currency fraud and faking his own kidnapping to avoid trial on those 65 counts. Then he hired, Nixon was out of office by then, he hired Nixon's law firm to fight his extradition to Italy, and they fought for a long time, seven or eight years, before Sindona was finally sent back to Italy, where he was convicted of murdering a bank examiner in connection with the failure of several of his banks over there, from which he had embezzled as much money as he had, as he had embezzled from the... Franklin National Bank over here. And then he was about to stand trial for conspiracy with Jelly and General uh, Michielli of the secret police and Michio Jelly uh, and this fascist conspiracy to overthrow the government of Italy. Before he could stand trial on that charge, he was poisoned in his cell. Roberto Calvi was indicted for embezzling from his own bank for laundering heroin money for the gray wolves and other groups in the Near East. But the Grey Wolves are especially interesting. They believe Allah, 
the Islamic God has appointed them to destroy the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now Allah, uh, like many gods, is inscrutable. He says, go do this, and he doesn't tell you how. The Grey Wolves are a bunch of poor Palestinians with uh, not a pot to piss in, so to speak, or at least they were when they started out. How are they going to overthrow Israel? Well, they figured out how. They started dealing heroin. And pretty soon they had enough money to buy lots of guns. And then they found another source of money. They started renting out some of their leading, their most talented young men as assassins to other terrorist groups around Europe. And that made more money for them. Finally, one of them tried to shoot the Pope for reasons that have never been explained. It gets Byzantine, doesn't it? <laughs> this money was being laundered through the Banco Ambrosiano, which was owned by the Vatican Bank, which was managed by Archbishop Paul Marchinkus. Have you ever heard of Archbishop Paul Marchinkus before tonight? Isn't that amazing? Everybody in Europe has heard of Archbishop Paul by now. And in this country, he got into the headlines back in uh, the early 70s, when Frank Hogan, the district attorney of New York, tried to extradite him to the United States to stand trial. And the Vatican refused to let him be extradited. And there was a bit of a tussle over that. What Hogan wanted Marchinkus to stand trial for was, Hogan had, uh, and his investigators, had discovered that the Rizzi family in New York and the Roselli family in Las Vegas uh, now, Johnny Roselli started out as a gunman for Al Capone, but he ended up running all the mafia projects in the Las Vegas, Nevada area. Johnny Roselli was frequently accused of being in on the Kennedy assassination by various uh, amateurish and bungling conspiracy investigators who aren't as smart as I am. Uh, I mean, by conspiracy investigators of the highest intelligence and integrity who arrived at different conclusions than me. Uh, Johnny Roselli and, uh, and the Rizzi family in New York printed a billion dollars in counterfeit stock and deposited them in the Vatican Bank, whereupon they disappeared. The Vatican Bank is the financial equivalent of a black hole. <laughs> uh, you know, a black hole, nothing ever gets out of, not even light. Even light can't escape from a black hole. Well, nobody knows what's going on in the Vatican Bank except the people who run it because the Italian bank examiners can't get in. Uh, the Vatican is not part of Italy. It's a sovereign state. That's why Noriega could take refuge in the Vatican embassy. It's a sovereign state. They have embassies just like any other government. They're not only a church, they're a government too. So nobody can get into the Vatican Bank. So once something gets into the Vatican Bank, it disappears from profane view, and only God and Archbishop Marchinkus know what becomes of it. So one billion dollars of counterfeit stock went into the Vatican Bank and was seen no more. Now, letters were produced in which Archbishop Marchinkus is corresponding with Johnny Roselli about getting this billion dollars in counterfeit stock. Now, the defenders of the good Archbishop, of whom you'll find quite a few among pious Roman Catholics who don't want to believe that an Archbishop would be engaged in knowingly dealing in counterfeit stocks, they claim he thought he was buying real stocks. He didn't know the Mafia prints counterfeit stocks. Well, that's possible. He gets, maybe he thought he was dealing in baby booties, and they never explained that. We got a billion. But if he thought he was buying real stocks, it's very strange that he paid only one tenth of the face value, because that's the going price for counterfeit stocks. <coughs> one tenth of the face value. Uh, counterfeit stocks travel around the world uh, faster and faster all the time, going in more directions. It's very much like quantum theory. You can never know where they are. You just know they've been here, and now they're going to be there. You never know where they are. Uh, if you have a business that's in trouble and you buy counterfeits, you buy enough counterfeit stocks, let's say you can be you got enough capital to, uh, let's say, just a million dollars. So you got a million dollars and you have debts of three million dollars and they're all, boy, the sheriff is at the door, your business might go bankrupt any day. So you take your million dollars and buy ten million dollars worth of counterfeit stocks. You deposit the $10 million of counterfeit stocks in your bank. You've now got a $10 million line of credit. You pay you off everybody you owe money to. You're not in trouble anymore. You expand your business. You hire new people. You buy, build new plants. And then you sell the stock to somebody else equally desperate. 
And if the, if the stock keep moving fast enough, they don't get caught. The stocks that get caught are not counterfeit stocks by and large. It's stolen stocks that, are, that banks are apt to notice. Counterfeit stocks, they sometimes notice, but if they move fast enough, the banks don't look at them that closely, and so they keep traveling. So this billion dollars in counterfeit stocks went into the Vatican Bank, and God knows where it went after that, but banks started <coughs> collapsing all over the world. Wall Street almost collapsed with this continuous turmoil in the international economic community because $10 billion in counterfeit stocks is more goddamn counterfeit stocks than have ever been loose at any one time before. Well, uh, District Attorney Hogan did not manage to extradite Marchinkus. Nixon intervened to protect Marchinkus. Uh, uh, there's an implication that Nixon was afraid of losing the Catholic vote. I don't know. Uh, Nixon also had uh, Sindona as a guest at his inauguration, so one feels there was a closer connection than just the Catholic vote. Um, in 1981, the district attorney of Dade County uh, indicted eight officers of the Royal Finance Corporation in Miami uh, for operating, he said, knowingly operating the largest cocaine laundromat ever uncovered. Uh, he. The DA got interested in the, this bank, the World Finance Corporation, because garbage men had told the police that they kept finding marijuana stems in the garbage. Now, not, not stems, the, 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 the stalks, the stalks that you break the stems off before you take the leaves off the stems, you know? They find great big marijuana stalks in the garbage all the time. And uh, these garbage men apparently weren't pot smokers themselves. Well, they would have kept their mouth shut and just went into the bank and said, can we buy some, you know? <laughs> but they went and told the police, and the police told the DA, and they put the bank under surveillance, and they very soon discovered that people were coming from Panama every day with uh, briefcases full of cash. Panama is the only country in the world that uses American dollars outside America as its currency. These people are coming in every day with briefcases full of money, not, not checks, cash. And this bank was running it all through the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas. And so the district attorney started investigating the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas. And guess who owned the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas? Archbishop Marchinkus and Roberto Calvi. And the money went from the Cisalpine Bank to the Vatican Bank, <laughs> along with all the heroin money from the Grey Wolves and the Catholic Church was getting richer all the time. And some of the money was going to Poland to support solidarity, which made the CIA very happy. Uh, a lot of the money found its way back to Central America to support the death squads that the CIA is running, because the Senate Intelligence Committee, from the time Jimmy Carter got in in 1976, until uh, Reagan got in in 1980, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, was getting a lot of cooperation from Stanfield Turner, who was the head of the CIA at that time, disapproved of the CIA's involvement with the drug business, and fired over 400 agents for being involved in the drug business. And the Senate Intelligence Committee was learning a great deal about the CIA's involvement in the drug business, so the CIA fired all these people, who thereupon went into the drug business in a much bigger way than ever before. And Theodore Shackley, who was running all this, was dispatched by them, according to the Christic Institute, who has doc which has documents, he was dispatched by them to persuade George Bush, who had been the supervisor of the whole project, to run for president. So if they could get Bush into the White House, they could go back into business as they were doing it before, inside the government instead of outside the government, and thereby have greater protection. Well, Bush did not win the presidency. He only got the vice presidency. But Reagan made him the head of the National Security Agency, which gave him oversight over the CIA. So they were all soon back in business again, which is why in 1981 they had this bank with eight CIA agents running it in Miami. And I was wondering, all this cocaine money to pay for the death squads, which Congress wasn't supposed to know anything about, and which most Americans still don't know anything about even today. You say death squads to most people, and they say, you, you mean the Nazis in the Second, in the second World War, something like that? No, we, I mean death squads right now all over Latin America, killing anybody who objects to American domination. 
They come into villages at night, they shoot people at random to terrorize the whole village. This is being paid for by the drug business. I'm sorry if you like cocaine, this may make you feel a bit queasy about it, but uh, I told you you wouldn't find this plot as funny as the first plot. I'm telling you occult secrets. These are things that are hidden that the profane do not know about, that are not revealed in the mass media. The uh, World Finance Corporation was run by Hernandez Cataya, who was one of the people, along with Howard Hunt, who had masterminded the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, in the Watergate tapes, don't they sound like Mae Russell? <laughs> uh, in the Watergate tapes, you find that Howard Hunt demanded a million dollars. Among other things, he not only threatened to tell the truth about Watergate, but he said he'd reveal that whole Bay of Pigs thing. And, and Nixon says, oh, we can't let him talk about that Bay of Pigs thing. I'll get the million dollars. I know how to get a million dollars. Remember that part of the tapes? And does anybody remember? It was way back. It was 73. Does anybody remember that plot back? <laughs> you, can, you, you can still see dramatizations of these tapes with Rip Torn playing Nixon <laughs> on television. Um, what Bay of Pigs thing was Nixon so worried about that he was willing to pay a million dollars? I thought all the Bay of Pigs secrets were out by 73. Apparently there was something that, they, that was still hidden in 73. And Nixon paid a million dollars to keep it covered up, and it hasn't come out yet. Hunt kept his mouth shut. Hunt's wife got the first payment of the million dollars, got on a plane, and the plane crashed just short of Chicago Airport, you may remember. The pilot was found to have an unusual concentration of cyanide in his blood. But the investigator who was appointed by Nixon, Nixon threw out the head of the FAA, which investigates such things, and put in somebody else who announced, oh, it's normal for people to have that much time to have a plane crash. That's, that's what they say, I swear, that's what they say. <laughs> when Ronald Reagan took office, Licio Jelly was a guest at the inaugural party. Remember Licio Jelly? He was the one who set up this whole uh, organization between the Knights of Malta, the CIA, and the cocaine business, and the death squads, and the Klaus Barbie and his old friends from the Gestapo. Uh, in 1944, before the invasion of Sicily, the OSS, the parent of the CIA, uh, went to uh, Lucky Luciano, who was serving a term for procure, procuring, or for running a prostitution ring, or whatever the hell is the legal term for it. And they told Lucky Luciano, we'll get you out of prison early if you will send messages to your friends in the Sicilian Mafia to help the American troops in the invasion rather than opposing them. Luciano agreed. The invasion of Sicily went off very smoothly and quickly. And the American intelligence community found itself uh, married to the Mafia from then on. They never did get untangled. After the war, they used the Mafia to uh, attack the French labor unions in southern France. And then onward uh, through Licio Jelly, they went after the Italian labor unions and so on. And uh, it gets harder and harder as uh, degenerate decades pass from the 1940s to the present. You can never say this was Mafia or this was CIA. The two are so intertwined that all you can say is this was Mafia and or CIA. On the other hand, William Casey, who died while well, under investigation in the Iran-Contra, wait a minute, that was General Musumichi, he died while under investigation in the Bologna Railway bombing. Oh, it happened to, it happened to William Casey, too. Uh, people under investigation often die suddenly. It's, uh, it's the stress of publicity, I guess. Uh, William Casey, like General Musumichi, was a knight of Malta. Just like Licio Gelli, who set this whole thing up, just like Roberto Calvi, who ran the Banco Ambrosiano and the Cisalpine Bank with Archbishop Marchinkus, Roberto Calvi was found hanging from a bridge in London on June 18, 1982. Uh, Scotland Yard ruled that it was suicide. There was a lot of criticism in the English newspapers, and there was especially a hell of a lot of criticism of the fact that the uh, Calvi was a Freemason and the detective who investigated for Scotland Yard was a Freemason too. 
and the Kalvi was found hanging where the rising tide had covered his dead body. Now the first degree oath in Freemasonry includes, or used to include, they changed it since Calvi's death, by the way, <laughs> it used to include, and if I ever betray my fellows in the craft, may I be hanged where the rising tide will cover my dead body. Which uh, pretty clearly indicates that Calvi was killed by his fellow Freemasons, or by somebody who ardently wishes us to think he was killed by his fellow <laughs> Freemasons. His wife claims he was killed by the Vatican. Uh, Clara Calvi has said consistently from the beginning, from the time Calvi was found hanging from the bridge, she still says, he told her, he called from London and said he was going to come back to Italy, surrender, turn state's evidence and reveal the people in the Vatican who had hatched all these major crimes he was involved in. Generally when you turn state's evidence on the crimes of that level, you get off and the other people take the fall. And uh, he said he's afraid that the Vatican will try to kill him, but he thought he had enough on them that they wouldn't dare do it in public. That's sort of the way uh, General Noriega feels right now. They won't dare do it. Well, everybody knows I'm here in the prison. And, uh, anybody want to give odds that Noriega will survive two months? <laughs> <laughs> two months. Two months? Three, how about three months? No. <laughs> Uh, Calvi's son also says the Vatican ordered his death. Uh, there's another book written by two Italian journalists who claims the Mafia killed Calvi because he sure changed them on one of the heroin deals. So there's more than one theory about Calvi. Uh, the interesting thing is the Knights of Malta include Otto von Habsburg, who's also a member of the Priory of Sion and the president of the Society for the United States of Europe and a direct descendant of Jesus Christ, if you believe the genealogies in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. <laughs> so maybe the earth is hollow after all. <laughs> in Costa Rica, there is a farm far, far away, and the farm belonged to a man named John Hull. How many people have ever heard of John Hull? Hey, hey, are we getting... We're getting to... <laughs> uh, John Hull is uh, an allegedly former CIA agent, like the eight guys who were running the World Finance Corporation in Miami. The DA claimed he could prove they were all still CIA agents. The CIA claimed they were ex-CIA agents. It seems to me the distinction is very metaphysical. Uh, anybody, it's, uh, it's been, uh, since Fouché at least, it's been common practice in the intelligence business to fire somebody when you want them to do something so bad that you don't want to track back to the agency. So they get fired and they get paid through a numbered bank account in Switzerland and they go on working, but nobody can prove it. And the eight guys who were running the Royal Finance Corporation laundering all that cocaine money seems to be in that class. And uh, John Hull was probably in that class too. He had a huge farm in Costa Rica. The Costa Rican government has indicted him for using the farm to re illegally receive arms from Ali North, transport the arms to the Contras in Nicaragua, pick up cocaine from the Contras, and ship the cocaine back to Miami. And uh, John Hull left Costa Rica as soon as they indicted him. He disappeared for a while. He was then reported in Miami. The Costa Rican government asked the American government to extradite him. The Justice Department replied that they couldn't find him. It turns out he's living on a ranch in Indiana. But the Justice Department still hasn't gotten around to extraditing him back to Costa Rica. Meanwhile, the Costa Rican government, after further investigation, has indicted John Hull for murder in the La Penca bombing, in which several journalists were killed trying to cover an interview, uh, a public statement by a guy who was on the side of the Sandinistas during the revolution against Somoza, decided he didn't like the Sandinista government, joined the Contras, decided he didn't like the Contras, and started his own revolution. And he was going to make a statement denouncing the Contras as being a tool of the CIA when the bomb was set, that killed several journalists. Uh, the Christic Institute claims to have enough evidence to prove that John Hull and his crowd at the ranch manufactured the bomb. 
and it was delivered by a CIA agent. The Costa Rican government believes it, and they indicted Hull for the murder. Uh, the media in this country, for some reason, is not interested in John Hull at all. You've got to hunt and I don't know how the hell you people ever found out about John Hull. You've got to hunt and hunt to find stories about the Hull case. Uh, Hull was introduced to Ali North by Dan Quayle. <laughs> uh, this was in the LA uh, Times the day Hull was indicted for murder. And I thought, Dan Quayle, now where have I heard that name before? And then I remember George Bush, who was persuaded to run for president by Theodore Sheckley. Theodore Sheckley, who was running the Seacord, Hakeem, Cocaine, and Guns Cartel all those years after Jimmy Carter threw them out of the CIA. Uh, and Theodore Shackley was running this whole goddamn guns cocaine thing. Uh, he, uh, wait a minute, I got so entangled in my grammar I forgot where I was going. Um, well, he asked Bush to run for president. Yeah, Theodore Shackley asked Bush to run for president. Bush didn't make it the first time. The next time he ran for president, he said, look at who I select for vice president. That will tell you all about me. <laughs> Now you track Dan Quayle's record back, and he was, after he got out of the Indiana National Guard, there's a hell of a lot of evidence that while serving in Congress, he was also working for the CIA, with the Hull, and with the Shackley bunch outside the CIA. That's how he got to know John Hull, whom he introduced to Ollie North. Now, if you look at Ollie North in his testimony, you will notice that he has a, a certain interesting expression in his eyes. And if you think back, those of you who are old enough, you remember another leading figure in 20th century politics who had that kind of expression in his eyes. That was Adolf Hitler, who was on cocaine almost continually from 1936 until he died. Adolf Hitler was the biggest coke freak in Europe. He was also taking steroids. And Hitler got more and more that same look that Ali North has. <laughs> you know that? I know I'm God, but I'm going to try to pretend I'm not while I take advantage of these schmucks. <laughs> uh, Timothy Leary says, speaking as a scientific psychologist, the effect of cocaine is to make you an obnoxious asshole. <laughs> now, uh, the most obnoxious assholes of the 20th century, Hitler and Ali Wood, right? <laughs> okay, cute cocaine psychosis. Uh, Fawn Hall has admitted in testimony to the DEA that she was using cocaine all the time she was working at the White House. Uh, she was dating one of the Contra leaders who was uh, bringing the cocaine up to Hull's ranch and dealing continually with Ali North. So when George Bush says, I'm going to show how bad the problem is, we'll go across the street and buy some cocaine, that's more <laughs> bullshit. All he had to do was walk down the hall and over the fucking White House. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to take another short break and then we have a question period and then I shoot like a bat out of hell to the San Francisco airport. Okay? Short break. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think, uh, well, George Washington said nations have no permanent allies, only permanent interests. Uh, mm -hmm. Conspiracies have no permanent allies, only permanent interests. Uh, Timothy Leary uh, said to me after reading Illuminatus, there are 24 conspiracies in every, every city, uh, every, every large social group. He says, when I was at Harvard, I saw there were 24 conspiracies fighting to take over Harvard. And when I was in Folsom, I saw there were 24 gangs trying to take over Folsom. The, the guards are only one gang. There's the Aryan Nation and uh, uh, the JDL, and there's all these other groups in there. And uh, curiously, that, that came up in a conversation with the former district attorney of Santa Barbara. He just spontaneously said uh, that he was talking about my books. He said, you know, in any city the size of, say, Santa Barbara, there are 24 groups fighting to take over the territory. And uh, that's why I don't believe in monolithic conspiracy theories. There's one group that runs everything. If there was one group that runs everything, the world would make a little sense. <laughs> when you start examining what's going on, it doesn't make any sense at all. But uh, like H.L. Mencken said, and he believed he was a polytheist because the universe looks like it was designed by a committee. <laughs> the world looks like it's run by a committee in which everybody's fighting, everybody else is standing, everybody else in the back, and uh, 
And uh, it's still the multiple, the multiple conspiracy model. And it makes more sense to me than the idea that there are no conspiracies, which is nonsense, because anybody who's ever worked for a corporation, those corporations conspire all the time. Politicians conspire all the time. Pot dealers conspire not to get caught by the narcs. The art world is full of conspiracies. Conspiracy is natural primate behavior. But there is no one conspiracy smart enough to run everything. If there was, the world would start to make sense. According to Colonel Tom Bearden, who is the most erudite, knowledgeable, and scientifically well-informed paranoid on the scene, uh, the Russians know how to alter reality. They know how to use the quantum equations to move from one parallel universe to another. And they're gradually moving us out of the universe we started into an entirely different universe. Now, if you want paranoid theories, try that one. <laughs> That's appearing all over the computer network, <coughs> right out of John Carpenter's film, They Live. The extraterrestrials are all around us, and the CIA allows them to genetically experiment on a certain number of human beings and mutilate a certain number of cattle, <laughs> and in return, they give the CIA the technology to brainwash the rest of us so we don't see what's going on. Uh, those theories are, uh, paranoid uh, theories are great for horror movies, but if you start taking them seriously, you'll go fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember you once spoke about owning a Macintosh, so it's a kind of technical question, but you just talk about those computer networks. What computer network would you get into if we had a Macintosh computer and a modem? Who would you call up and get into for your news sources? <laughs> That's, uh, I don't have a modem. I've deliberately resisted getting a modem because a friend gave me a pile of computer games and I found after about a month that my productivity as a writer had gone straight down. <laughs> I was spending so much time with the computer games. So I decided I'm not going to get a modem until my earnings from my writing <laughs> where I can afford to take off a couple of months every year and just play with the modem. <laughs> Yes. Where did you get your source for uh, the Gospel of Christ, Mary Magdalene? Um, various Gnostic Gospels and my own perverted imagination. <laughs> yes. Are you uh, going to go to that psychedelics conference at the Claremont Hotel in, on the 24th? No. I haven't been invited and I got a lot of other work. Yes. May I have a two-part question also? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that, that's the last question. Actually, it should be easy. Uh, what's Jacques Vallée doing on his compilation of the UFO sightings and whatnot? What, who? Jacques Vallée? Yeah. Uh, Any new conclusions type of thing? Yeah. The last I heard, he was convinced that the UFOs are a disinformation system created by an intelligence agency, and that writing about it just made him sound paranoid, so he concentrated on running his computer business and writing a book on how to use computers intelligently and has just given up on the whole UFO thing. Unless something new has happened that I haven't heard about. The second part? Actually, it's related. Um, I was reading in your book recently um, that, uh, that he said, uh, he gave in gracefully. They relate in space, time, and ways which we, for which we have at present no concepts. So I was wondering if he had made any advancements or, or if he No, that was 1976, uh, or 75 maybe. Conversation at a party? Yeah, no, he changed his opinion after Tell that. Us. He changed his opinion quite a bit after that. He decided it was an intelligence agency setting up a simulation of spaceships to hide something else they're doing. Yes. Would you before you I leave? Get going. I know. Would you before you leave in a few sentences tell us why it's more fun to be optimistic than paranoid? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean that's pretty obvious on the face of it. Well, one thing: longevity statistics. Optimists live longer. John Barefoot of Duke University has collected a lot of statistics on that. Optimistic people outlive pessimistic people consistently. If you compare them by sex, by age, by eating habits and diet by lifestyle, by race, by all sorts of things, the optimists live longer. Uh, also, optimists have more fun. And besides, uh, maybe things are going to turn out okay, in which case the pessimists are killing themselves and being miserable for no good reason at all. <laughs> and the final reason is even if everything is going to turn out terribly, the optimists are having more fun before the final tragedy comes. Whereas the pessimists are living in misery all the time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.